I had prepared a whole presentation for you, and after our discussions yesterday, I realized that um, down-to-earth practical information might be way more informative than me presenting some theoretical um, overview of the ideological problematics of practice in Africa um, and how the market is influencing that and not the problems of how um, the established market that we see in the Northern Hemisphere can or cannot engage with um, what's happening in Africa itself. So I thought that what I would do is I do need to create a context of some description because if um, because what, what we see happening in the market in Africa cannot be separate or separated from Africa's colonial history, um, the way that uh, uh, visual arts or fine arts practice originally happened there. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll move on to a more straightforward discussion of um, the market and how it operates. And what I'm going to do, just because you know we have 52 countries in Africa, and unlike Sarah Palin, um, I do understand Africa is not a country. <laughs> um, I'm going to use South Africa um, because the project that I'm working on happens to be there as a case study. Um, but the information that I'm going to give you could be applied to many other African states, Nigeria, etc. So, um, Africa consists of 54 states which have absolutely no relationship to the languages or to the cultural inheritances of how those states exist. These states were drawn up by Europeans at various stages in the colonial um, and then the independence movements in Africa. So what we see is com completely arbitrary borders um, borders that are, to a large extent, um, mute, mutate constantly through war, through um, cultural groups that live on either side of these weird um, man-made lines. So um, how does one really even begin to understand the practice of a system which traditionally um, is, if you look at the way that museum practice works, you know, we always have on a label where the artist was born and where they work, you know, and if where they're born is completely arbitrary, um, not even decided on that person's cultural positioning, you know, where do we begin? Um, so I thought I'd show, I'm going to show you four pictures, this is not going to be an art history lesson. I thought I'd begin with showing you a piece by Andrew Putter. He's an artist who was born during the apartheid period, and I um, refer to that specifically because right now the most exciting work is coming from what we call the born freeze, those younger black artists who were born post-apartheid. Remember Mandela was freed, and we had our first um, democratic elections in Southern Africa in 1994. So we, I'm talking about artists who were born very close or after the end of apartheid. Um, he was born during that period, and his entire investigation looks at um, perceptions that the West has of Africa and perceptions of what Africa has of the West. Um, and as Conrado said, that perhaps um, a lot of us are not aware of what's happening in Africa, both in the work that's been produced and this extraordinary market that's developing, um, which I'll talk about a little later. So um, an exercise that I do with my students is I ask them to look at these pictures and ask them to determine which they feel more comfortable with, which one seems more natural to you. Is it the one on the left, where there's a young, handsome white man dressed in what would be seen as traditional garb? Um, or is it the rather stoic-looking black man on the right, dressed in this kind of 1970s Wall Street suit? Now, I don't know about you, but 
my response is, well, and the one on the right seems more plausible. And I think that that's perhaps the indicative problematic of any engagement that any of us will have with Africa, whether it's the market, whether it's the content of the work, and that is the imposition of value systems that we have, that we impose there. Um, and what would happen if, in fact, the opposite were true? In fact, if Africa's aesthetic or systematics were imposed on us as white Westerners. I mean, I don't really see myself as an Af as a European, but... Um, so let's look at the uh, history of practice of museums in Africa. The first major museum in Africa was built in 1892. I'm sure the majority of you have visited it. It's the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Um, this museum, um, to a large extent, determined an anthropological presentation of objects. In other words, objects taken out of their context, um, shown within a Western idiom, in other words, an object on a plinth with a label, protected with certain kind of systems of engagement. And to a large extent, that's exactly the practice that exists to this day. Um, so the natural um, impetus for all of us would just be to continue with that practice. And you'll see that many of both the museums and commercial galleries, um, and I do use that word, although yesterday somebody suggested it's a, a dirty division, but I think it is a division, um, continue to use that kind of Western viewpoint of how to present work and how to value objects. Um, we haven't had any major museum built in Africa for the visual arts since 1892. There were um, attempts um, at the turn of the last century um, by what we call the Rand Lords, um, individuals like um, Max Michaelis, um, Rhodes, Sister John Rhodes, etc., to establish visual arts museums, but these were museums that were made very much with a context of, well, let's bring white, mainly British Anglo culture to Africa to educate the, in inverted commas, natives. Um, so they landed up being rather irrelevant um, institutions, um, which were not accessed or used by a broad spectrum of society and to a large extent have now completely failed in their practice. And you see this across the whole of Africa. Um, so it seems like I'm talking doom and gloom. Of course, I can go on to even more complex problematic issues. And if we now start with uh, South Africa as a case study, in 1948, um, the National Party, which was the Afrikaans Party, came to power and instituted um, official or legalized segregation um, and remained in um, that system remained in place until 1994. This was a system that forcibly removed 3.5 million people and forced them to literally physically leave their homes and go somewhere else. So there was a conscious separation of culture, um, a s conscious segregation of how people practiced um, culture. And I'm, when I'm sp speaking about culture, I'm speaking about visual, music, but also human interaction, food, religion, marriage, everything. Um, this system was put in place um, across Africa in most of the British colonies. With the abolition of slavery, there was an attempt to break it down. Um, but unfortunately, that didn't happen in South Africa, and we landed up with, um, as you all know, one of the most corrupt um, times in modern history. Um, so we have a whole series of museums and commercial galleries and not-for-profits and arts associations and community-run organizations, which to a large extent stick with the status quo, and they produce um, what the world 
in that little universe expects them to produce. At the same time, we have a cultural boycott um, which excludes any academic from that part of the world participated in um, the West and excludes any academic or artist coming to Southern Africa to practice their work. So there's a complete divide. And it reminds me a little bit about, um, I remember after the bombings of 9-11 when George Bush um, said, if you're not with us, if you're not for us, you're against us. So there was no possibility to have your own opinion, to have a complex process of how you decide to fit into this world. Um, so what the natural response, um, which people thought at the time, was that um, South Africa just became completely independent. We produced ways of making our own fuel, we established our own cultural organizations, our own hospitals, our own universities, uh, everything, and we just closed ourselves off from the world. How does that impact now um, on how the world sees us or how the world sees Africa? Now, you might say, well, he keeps talking about South Africa. I'm going to ask you to bear with me for a few minutes um, because I'm going to explain a little later how South Africa and the market in South Africa is to a large extent the gateway to the the majority of trade of fine art on the continent. Um, there's been a, a phenomena that's happening because of the infrastructure that exists, but I'll get onto that in a minute. Um, so you have a, a, a country that to a large extent has prided itself on its self-sufficiency, its cultural independence, and its ability to survive. We now live in a time where, I mean, last night at dinner, it was so much fun for me meeting people with different viewpoints, different practices, from different geographical regions. We now have a time where art functions, I hate the word, but much more globally. And yet you have a, a territory which, is not, which does not have the skills or the experience of practicing in, a, in that way. What does that mean? Does that mean that um, the making of art and the trading of art um, is something that enhances the practice there, or is it something that has discredits it? My opinion is, in fact, that the separation has done extraordinary um, things. It's created a content for the work um, that's been produced in Africa, and specifically Southern Africa, which has a rigorousness, which I find in very few places in the world. Um, when I did the Leipzig show many years ago, um, after the um, reunification of Germany, um, it was one of the few times when I felt that same phenomena of this unbelievable commitment to this craft, regardless of whether there was a market or prestige, or value, or even a livelihood um, possible in this practice. So you have an art community um, and an industry that has gone on doing this um, and to a large extent have subsidized it out of love. So we had a system in the past where, and um, you know, I grew up in Southern Africa, I left 25 years ago, um, where curators were also dealers, were also art critics, were also judges. You basically did everything and you got paid for nothing. The way artists survived was that you would all buy from each other's shows. You'd all do like agreements to help each other produce the work. So um, again, a kind of new kind of self-sufficiency. Now the world opens up and um, the cultural boycott is lifted and the whole world is interested in us. Um, I did a study a while back where I looked at um, 10 years of major biennales and I counted the artists from Africa included, which was hardly anything. Then I counted the number of South African artists included. And in some of, of the major biennales, over 10% of the participants were from South Africa. So there was this real kind of focus academically and curatorially on the practice that was coming out of South Africa. Um, the market was not there to back it up, so it was a very kind of 
content-driven um, phenomena. Um, but that meant that a lot of education was happening. All the major curators and serious collectors were seeing this stuff. And, you know, if we um, start just thinking of some names, you know, Marlene Dumas, who um, is a highly traded artist um, with enormous, I'm not now, her market is um, not as kind of um, volatile as it was, but I remember a few years ago where court cases were happening between collectors and gallerists to get an access to money. You know, Marlene Dumas is a little Afrikaans girl from Cape Town. Um, I think of William Kentridge. I don't think that um, one can question the success of him um, institutionally. I mean, how many more Kentridge retrospectives will we see, you know? How many more do, how many more do we have to see? <laughs> Not that I'm saying he's not a great artist, he's a brilliant artist, but you know, think of um, Alan Atsui, you know, uh, we have been trying to get one for our collection for years and the prices are astronomical and it's very difficult to get museum quality pieces. So I think that, um, and I can, you know, won't get Chimutu, um, uh, Kada Atia, I mean there are some major artists out there that I think we've almost forgotten or even from the continent in some way and we just see them as um. so what happens next um, the institutional system in South Africa is was and to a large extent still is based on European model so that means the state supports art um, at the end of apartheid the government um, removes all the um, incentives to donate to the arts because what they discover is happening is that everybody remains supporting Eurocentric practice. So the banks sponsor ballet, the corporate sponsor opera and choirs and rugby and cricket and nothing that's engaging with the joy of living in Africa or the issues of being a human being in Africa. So the government says, this isn't working, we'll take the taxes and we'll reallocate the funds. But as we know across the world, um, the state eventually, because of the financial crises, withdraws state funding. And so we've seen most museums in Africa collapse. And I'm talking about not only museums, but university galleries, art schools, not-for-profits, basically across the board. Um, they still are open, but there's no one there. There's no programming, there's no impact. But somehow behind um, the scenes, um, and I must say that um, for myself as well, um, you know, I was gone for 25 years. Yes, I did go home to visit my family, but I spent time with them. I didn't really engage as much as I should have been with the practice or the industry, let's say. Seven months ago, I returned to do a major project, and I'll talk about that at the very end for a few minutes, because I can hardly be here uh, and not share how excited we are about the next major museum in Africa. Um, so I go back seven months ago, and I'm put in a situation where I'm kind of an outsider, and I think that that outsider-ness um, really helps one to see clearly because you're not involved in the politics, in the power games. You can actually just get a really good overview of what's happening. And what I see has happened is that the market itself, it's the commercial galleries who have taken on the responsibility of art making, of art producing, of museum support, of production, of literally everything that is segmented in other industries. So if we use some examples, the gallery, which is the oldest um, surviving contemporary art gallery, is called Goodman Gallery. It was founded by Linda Goodman. Um, it uh, sold a couple, of, well, maybe, I don't know how many years ago, maybe uh, eight or nine years ago, to a woman called Lisa Esses. The Goodman Gallery, if you go to the National Museum, the majority of donations to the National Museums were done by the Goodman Gallery. If you went to any major Biennale and you looked at the label, production costs supported by the Goodman Gallery. So what happened was that the commercial galleries became not only the place that traded art, but they were the ones that also supported the artists in museum shows globally, produced the catalogs, commissioned the essays. So there was a whole kind of 
transfer of responsibility over. Um, now, we can go into great depth to discuss whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. The reality is it happened. And there's been a whole flowering of other commercial galleries. Um, and I'm going to give you some names because I think it's really important that you go out there and you Google because these are people who are practicing on the same level as any not mid level gallery, as any major gallery in the world. Their spaces are enormous. I mean, we're looking at 3,000 square meters, some of these spaces, 35, 40 staff members, divisions just for publishing, you know, um, divisions just for education. Um, so some of the galleries that you should look at, the Goodman Gallery I've mentioned, Stevenson Gallery, which is an extraordinary gallery, which has um, popped up over the last few years. There's a young gallery called What If the World? Um, another one called Brundain, B-R-U-N-D-Y-N-E. Um, Blank Projects and Gallery Momo, M-O-M-O, -M -O, I would say are the six. Of course, there are problematics. There's only one gallery in the entire country that's owned and operated by um, a black gallerist. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done there. But so we find that what happens is um, an entire industry has been supported through the commercial sector. And so well that I come to Barcelona and in one of your local institutions, there's a photography show of Peter Hugo arranged by Stevenson Gallery. So museums, because of the inability to talk with their colleagues in Southern Africa, have now actually just taken to talking to commercial galleries. So it changes, even the power relationships between major international, international institutions have changed. You know, traditionally, museums um, don't like to be, or they don't like to admit that they're influenced by the commercial sector, although of course they are. Um, without the commercial galleries, I think a lot of us curators wouldn't know what the hell's going on. But anyway, um, so you see extraordinary relationships being developed by major collectors and curators at the world's top museums and engaging and following the advice and guidance of commercial gallerists, which I think is pretty extraordinary. Um, then what happens, which is even more interesting, is that um, through the power financially of how these commercial galleries have operated, they start understanding that they will take responsibility for the entire continent. So what you see in these galleries, um, pan-African, is that they become galleries that don't represent artists from the region, but from the entire continent. Um, so their programs become very diverse, um, which means that more power is held in the hands of these commercial galleries because now they're the go-to point um, for everything about contemporary practice on the continent. Now again, I think a lot of people would get very nervous with the situation and say, oh my God, is this a good thing that commercial galleries have so much influence and so much power? Personally, I think it is because in a system that was a public institution system that was corrupt for decades, and then following that it has not really managed to find a voice for itself, the market has taken a much more democratic, open kind of attitude. Um, so where's the money coming from? Um, as you know, there's enormous mineral wealth in South Africa, and I'm talking about or Southern Africa, Mozambique, Angola, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. So individuals who own mines with enormous funds are putting collections together. I see, um, you know, when um, Art Basel, Miami Beach first started, and there was a kind of frenzy of everyone was collecting and everyone was buying and everyone was opening their own museum, the same thing is happening in Cape Town. You know, um, there are a couple of museums that have opened up, which to a large extent are museums and they aren't museums. They're more like private spaces open to the public um, with staff, with publishing programs, where they use their permanent collections um, as their kind of resource to show. 
they're so respected now that what's happening is the public museums are loaning to private collectors. Not so again, it's there's so many models which we're not used to. Traditionally, galleries and artists loan to museums, and now it's happening the other way around. Um, what's also happening is that we see that commercial galleries are curating exhibitions in the museums. So Goodman Gallery curates shows in the Johannesburg Gallery, which is a national institution or a, a municipal space. So there's this trust in the experience and the ability of the commercial sector where the public institutions actually relinquish their responsibility to the commercial sector. What's fascinating for me is that it hasn't been abused, that there's this real commitment and love for the subject that um, the commercial sector is not taking this merely to promote their own agendas or line their own pockets. Yes, a lot of people are getting extremely wealthy through this process, um, some of the artists and some of the gallerists. Um, but at the same time, there's still this commitment back to the development of art itself. Um, so it's, it's pretty extraordinary. I've not actually seen anything like this anywhere else in the world, except sometimes you see it in um, South America, you know, where there's this kind of this need of the private collector to step in when public museums or civil society can't deal with it by themselves. Um, so the galleries now are on this kind of um, race to see who will represent the continent the best and who will corner the market. So we see about three or four players and they travel in, they have staff that are traveling constantly negotiating with artists. So to give you an example, when Angola won the Golden Lion at the Venice Biennale last, two years ago, sorry, no, last year, um, before anybody could sneeze, um, a commercial gallery in South Africa had already signed the artist. Um, and um, we acquired the whole pavilion for our museum, which I'll talk about in a minute, but um, it's extraordinary the speed and the ability that these people have. I think it has to do with the fact that um, the global art market in totality has not woken up to what's happening there quite yet. Um, it's a little unknown territory for a lot of us. So it allows, it's very open for the people who are there who understand what's going on to kind of go in and kind of take responsibility. Um, so if you Google those five galleries that I've given you um, and look at the program, you'll see it's artists from East Africa, West Africa, right across the continent, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, now what happens? Um, so the latest thing since I've been back there is all the museum groups. So we've had a major visiting group, about 60 people from the Tate, the Guggenheim, MoMA, Seattle, Newark, they all come in. And this is not something that I'm used to in a region or in a place that doesn't have an Art Basel or an, or an Armory or a Whitney Biennale. So there are the curators who've somehow been connected to what's happening there have now formed special interest groups at their museums. And they've got these huge groups that arrive. They hit town and they're like um, vacuum cleaners. They literally just go to every gallery and they just suck up whatever they can find. And they just buy everything and then ship it back. In the process, they also buy for their museums. Now, um, a couple of people have asked me, well, who's buying everything? So we have the local collectors with huge mineral wealth. Remember that South Africa has become, to a large extent, um, a certain kind of <sighs> regional power, let's say, um, just like many of the other BRICS nations. Um, so besides the mineral wealth, there's, of course, oil in um, certain areas. But um, digital technology, cell phone networks, um, communication technologies across the continent um, are owned or operated from companies in South Africa. The retail sector, so in other words, your Walgreens from the United States or your Sainsbury's or I don't know what your big chains are, yeah, your Zara's, whatever, um, are all operated and owned by South African companies. Um, a large extent of the bank, Standard Bank, operates out of South Africa um, on the continent as Stan Bic Bank. So you have enormous wealth that's been built 
Um, what we did see after the end of apartheid was that a number of the corporations took their money offshore. A number of these private individuals took their money out. But inevitably what happens when a society stabilizes, um, you have a commitment to that place. That's where you love, that's where your soul is. So these people have returned, not with all their assets, they still leave them in safe places, but they bring a lot of their assets with them and they are driving the acquisition of work produced there. What's happening now, the groups are coming. They become diplomats and they go out. There's also other phenomena that are driving this. Um, most public museums around the world have neglected contemporary African practice. So, um, like we have with the anthropological um, thing that I spoke about earlier, we see that public museums collected masks, drums, objects, whatever. So major institutions like the Smithsonian, and this, for every one Smithsonian, there's another 10,000 museums um, around the world who have some kind of focus or interest in Africa because their collections, you think of the de Menil, for instance, has a very strong African collection. And these are collections that say, well, hmm, I wonder what's happening now. Let's check it out. So there's this whole industry that's developed about people buying up work. So we see that the institutions globally are basically constantly engaging with acquiring what's happening. Um, it's unfortunate, but because of a very developed gallery system, South African artists are getting the majority of the attention, or artists represented by South African galleries, because they have the marketing and the information platforms in place to be able to promote certain artists. So it's not unpredictable to see Peter Hugo here, because he has a gallerist that's exceptionally good at promoting their stable. You know, they make a catalog for every single exhibition. I'm not sure if there's many commercial galleries in the world that would catalog every single show. So they've, because they so, and again, this disadvantage of being separated for so long, so far away, the galleries have found ways to bridge that gap through communication. So you'll see catalogs being produced by everybody sent to every curator, to every collector. Um, now what I'm seeing is the commercial galleries arriving. And it's been pretty extraordinary for me being there because I see who's arriving first. And I'm thinking, shit, that's why they're such the top galleries. Because it's all the major galleries from the UK, from London, and from New York who've arrived, sniffed around, and they come by the dozens, every week with their staff. They don't take the artist immediately, they do a couple of visits. They then include them on a summer show or group show, see how they go. But now we've seen the Victoria Miros and the Marion Boskis and um, all of them starting to do solo exhibitions of these artists. And I can't, I mean, because it, it would be unethical for me to talk publicly about it, but the level of gallerists who are actually coming from New York, if I gave you the names, you'd be quite shocked. So I think what I'm seeing now is that the ones in the know, let's so, realize that something is happening um, about Africa and something's happening specifically about Southern Africa. You know, we have this kind of art world fashion where we kind of say, oh, India's next, it's all run, and then Leipzig, and then, oh, it's China, you know, like, and a lot of what I'm hearing now, if you look especially um, in the practices in the UK, indicate that there's going to be a focus on Africa, which we think will reach some kind of peak in the next three to four years. Um, and so these kind of aggressive gallerists um, who come in first, they're there already, and they've already signed some really amazing artists. Why are they doing this? Um, they're quite honest with me. They know there's a market developing, and they want somebody in their stable to be able to capitalize on that market. It's a purely um, financial-driven dis decision. They understand that um, the trade of art is no longer a Eurocentric or Northern Hemisphere practice. Um, the BRICS nations do have um, collectors, 
these collectors oftentimes don't want to only buy in their own regions. Um, I'll never forget when I was living in Miami, Fred Snitzer would say to me he couldn't understand why he would show Hernan Bass in Miami, and the Miamians, and then he would take it to Basel or to the Armory, and all the Miamians would fight about who gets the piece. I didn't understand this in the beginning, um, but just recently, a couple of years ago, I was at Art Basel, and Stevenson showed Zanelli Maholi um, in a solo presentation, and I bought the work. And I had seen the work 50 times before in Cape Town, but seeing the work outside of your own country in a context with, with, with many other artists helps you to understand it more clearly. It helps you to understand where it fits in. It helps you to understand its relevance whether it's evocative, whether your relationship back home is sentimental or if it's real. So sometimes to take it out really helps. So I think a number of the commercial gallerists are now grabbing these artists because they understand that there's a, a huge collector base that none of us are aware of that need to be serviced. And they're happy to do that job. <laughs> if somebody's going to make the sales, they're happy to do it. Um, so... Yeah, it's an extraordinary thing that I've seen happen there where um, the commercial sector has driven this new kind of flowering of contemporary practice and taken complete responsibility for the promotion of the artist, the production of the art, the funding of the system, and everything that is entailed in getting your work into biennales, into collections globally, etc. What does that uh, mean for all of us? Um, I think that um, unlike China, which I'm sorry, I don't know about you guys, but I still haven't figured out how to negotiate it. You know, and I've worked with many big collectors in many regions, but it's just, it's very tough. You know, I remember when we bought um, Zhang Huan and the editions ran out and then there were other editions appearing by artists that had collaborated with him and felt, well, we're also part of that, so we can also make our own pictures. And no, 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 but that's, you know, it's like, but what you see in um, the system in Southern Africa is a very ethical, controlled system. With, so it's a system that's very familiar. If you went there, you would be very comfortable in the process. You go to the openings, you meet the collectors, you have the fancy dinner, you all schmooze, you make the sale. It, it's quite simple. And I'm not quite sure why, and I, we, and I include myself in this, have not been so familiar or we're not so up to date with what's actually happening there. Um, now, should I be sharing this information or should I say we should just leave it alone because something extraordinary is happening? Maybe we should just let it rest for a while, but um, I don't think that's going to happen. I think that it's happening quickly. Seeing the level of people that are coming to visit already um, indicates that, you know, when those first people are there, it snowballs after them. Um, so I suppose it's up to each of us now to, to figure out how we engage with this new phenomena. Um, I think um, it's going to last a little while. i tell you why, because Georgina and I, disc I were discussing this in the taxi. How many more times can we revisit abstraction, you know, in painting? I mean, I think it was eight years ago where now painting's dead and now it's alive and drawing. Uh, whereas we haven't really even begun to investigate what's happening um, in Southern Africa. And um, so I think that there's a newness and a freshness and a new territory that's exciting. And artists who have filtered through the system up until this point, have filtered through because they wanted to do it, because they needed to do it, not because it was financially lucrative. We do see now an, a new generation of artists who see huge um, income opportunities. So we see, you know, I don't want to mention names, but I'm sure you know the examples I would refer to. Um, we see them coming up, but what we see before that is a real, and I hate this word, but a real authentic, authentic practice. Um, Maybe I should quickly talk about, let me just check for the time so we can see how we're doing. Oof, okay, three minutes and I have to stop. Um, so what makes uh, cultural capital? Um, 
you know, I was thinking last night about what makes Barcelona important. And I have to see this from my point of view. Uh, what makes Barcelona important? Well, Carlos and Emilio do loop, and they're extraordinarily kind to me, and they always make me feel like a million dollars, and that's why I come, honestly. I mean, and that friendliness and that kindness. But obviously, um, if relationships are not in place, because none of us are connected with the African continent, no matter how wonderful the people are, it's not going to make us go. So what makes a cultural capital? I think you need good university art schools. There's 16 university art schools in South Africa alone. And I'm talking about where, um, schools where you can go up to a master's or a PhD level. There's a whole network of national institutions. They don't work, but they're there, and they have permanent collections with staff with extraordinary skills. Um, you need art fairs. There's two fairs. They're young, small, boutique fairs, the Joburg Art Fair, the Cape Town Art Fair. You need a good secondary market. Um, Strauss & Co., which have now cornered the market for secondary sales in Africa. You know, up until recently, Bonhams, I think, was the kind of that, that was their territory. Strauss & Co. have now, in both um, lot numbers and total sales, have taken over that. They will announce, I think tomorrow, in fact, the first contemporary art auction in Africa. Um, you need collectors, which we've already done. You need gallerists. You need journalists. I remember reading last year that the LA Times had um, taken away the only full-time job for an art critic in Los Angeles. South Africa has, I would say, maybe 16 full-time art critics who are play employed by the... So there is an ex extraordinary... Th but for some reason, there still hasn't been an iconic something to grab the imagination of the world and say, shit, maybe that happens. Um, so I'll have to show you a picture now. Yeah. So that's where um, I come in. Um, Mr. Zeitz, who's the former CEO of Puma, um, remember that Puma is owned by um, the former PPR, now Car Caring Group, Mr. Pino. Um, Mr. Zeitz collects contemporary work from Africa. I met Mr. Zeitz when I was about to leave the Rubel collection, and we had a conversation in a pizza house, um, and he said to me, what's your next steps? And I said, well, I, my great dream is to go and build a major museum in Africa, um, because it needs an iconic um, space for the practice of art to be written, or at least part of the practice of art to be written by Africans. To a large extent, um, the way that the history of African art has worked is that it's been outsiders that have described the narrative. Um, and he said, I really like that idea, I love Africa, what do you need? So um, I said to him, well, no budget, because I want you to give me the funds with no end. So <laughs> there can't be a limited budget to buy the collection for the museum and then to build the museum. So he said, fine, let's do it. So over the last five and a half years, I've been traveling across the entire continent. We shortlisted four cities, Bamako, Nairobi, Johannesburg, and Cape Town. We had to do some really hard thinking and decision making. Um, and although it would have been such an amazing statement to have built this museum in Soweto in Johannesburg, we realized it would have fulfilled a, a very important role in a local community, but not engaged with an international community because where it was, transport routes, etc. Nairobi, the pollution levels were just way too high. We just could not find a way to protect the objects. Um, you know, Bamako, a lot of social unrest, so it landed up being Cape Town. Um, it's a private-public partnership. Uh, it's 1.2 billion rand, so that's 120 million dollars. And we put those funds together in about six weeks. Now, that gives you an idea of the ambition of this community. Um, now, you might say, well, 120 million dollars, well, that's just a mid-sized museum in the US. 
about $120 million in South Africa is like a fortune beyond anybody's dreams for culture. You know, it's just like you're talking about the entire cultural budget of the whole country for decades. Um, so that there's, what we see is a country right now which has become an ambitious. Um, we see in a country where people are, they say, we want to matter. And we want to matter in various ways, academically, commercially, industrially, but also culturally. So they count in on this institution to position them. Um, I think it's very dangerous because obviously a lot of the corporates are hearing the Bilbao phenomena, which we all know is not true. You know, I mean that was a whole part of an entire regional replanning and a city replanning, and the Guggenheim was just a very small, you know, and I think the the Guggenheim Foundation has sold the kind of Guggenheim solution very effectively. Um, and oftentimes, as we know, it just doesn't work. You know, I mean, museums open, get into problems and close. But um, anyway, that's beside the point. I need to be positive. Um, so um, it was the tallest building in Africa until 1972. Um, it's situated at the VA waterfront, which has 24 million visitors annually. It's the most visited site, tourist site in Africa. That was the one of the things that really pushed us over the edge in choosing the site because we realized it could be in a position where it can communicate with the world. Um, and to a certain extent, it's changed. The institution itself has changed the entire practice and market of contemporary art in the region because we are buying between 80 and 150 pieces a month for the permanent collection, to build the collection. Uh, and um, people are committing their private collections, they're donating huge amounts of money for endowments for curators, programs, etc. So there's a real kind of um, confidence in this. What we see is happening is all the practices around it all of a sudden are doing better as well because the confidence that this is driving is driving the market as well. Um, we've commissioned Thomas Heatherwick, who's the British architect, to do the piece for us. Um, we were worried that we would be criticized by not choosing a local architect, but we want the piece to be a bridge and to talk to all our friends all over the world. So he was the best choice, and he's come up with an extraordinary solution to cut a piece of grain the shape of a grain in the inside of the tubes. Um, to give an idea of scale, um, this is twice the height of the Louvre pyramid, the atrium. So like the turbine hall at the Tate, it'll give us the possibility of commissioning large-scale monumental interventions by artists. Um, and this is what the museum will look like on the interior. There's eight zero, 80 galleries. Most of them are quite monumental in scale. There's 16 education centers um, distributed throughout the 80 galleries. There's four independent centers, a center for curatorial excellence, a center for the moving image with five cinemas, a center for performative practice with four stages and a kind of public space, and then an education center, which is the floor, just one up from the bottom. There's three and a half thousand parking spots underground, so we can allow people to have direct access into the museum. Uh, sculpture garden on the top, restaurants, coffee shops, pff, all the normal nonsense that you need. Uh, we've been working on it now for five and a half years. We have about two years to go, um, so the structure is pretty far along, and we'll open at the end of 2016. Um, so we hope that the institution um, will become a symbol of all the excellent work that's been happening in this part of the world. And um, every talk I give or every presentation, I try to really emphasize that this is not us doing it. You know, this is not Mr. Zeitz and I saying, we are gonna build the biggest museum in Africa. And we, it's really recognizing the extraordinary work that's already happened there, which has been driven to a large extent by the market. Um, and now we can come and we can kind of contribute and create a public space for this dialogue to take that extraordinary stuff that we see 
and hopefully share it with the world and hopefully create a reason for the world to come as well to see this and then um, the building the, um, we believe will be the most iconic architectural structure in South Africa for about the last hundred years. The last iconic buildings we had were built by the British architect Sir Herbert Baker, which is a very long time ago. <laughs> we um, inherited the dearth of modernism, of really ugly, cheaply built high rises. So um, there's a lot counting on this building from an architectural heritage point of view, from a point of view of exporting um, culture, design, um, craft to the rest of the world. But then I think also affirming um, the capabilities of creativity in Africa and also a successful, confident, professional market. Yeah, so I'm going to end there. I don't know if anyone has any comments or questions, but um, this is my baby for the next couple of years. <laughs> Don't tell me I made some, said something wrong, Alan. It's too early. <laughs> oh, this one, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Hi. Um, I was just wanting to know about the role of the artist prior to the commercial gallery system developing. Um, in the 90s, the, the artist initiatives were really what, 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 what was going on there. Yes. The Bag Factory, Triangle Arts Trust. And there, you know, that was really the powerhouse of what was going on. And what is their role these days? Has it all been sort of taken over by, I mean, in terms of the grassroots activity mm. beyond this gallery commercial system? You know, I would, I agree with you that um, I think for a very long time, everything was artist driven. But it was a bit of a catch-22 situation because was um, the Triangle Arts Trust across Africa are very important, Kwana, Bag Factory, Great Moor Studios, I mean, I mean, Gas Works in London, etc. But these were um, run by, um, in a very kind of short time period. So in other words, you got a residency, you went there, and then you left. Or workshops came in for two weeks, you were with the most amazing visiting artist, and then they left, and you were left in the, the same. And I think that um, those... Um, initiatives were really important, but my opinion is they've kind of passed their sell-by date. Um, it's like the ICA in London. You know, the ICA was so important at a time, but I'm just not sure what its role is anymore, and I don't think it's, it's figured out what its role is right now. Um, so I think that you don't... Because of a, of a very powerful market, you don't need, s to the same extent, these kind of charitable support structures to take artists from university through a period before they find some way to produce their work and, 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 and be successful at it. That's, that's time is becoming very compressed. So I think that um, the fact that those things are not needed is actually really great um, because they didn't have capability to give enough, and it was not long-term, and it was not sustained engagement. Um, and I think that artists who are working now, who, who have ambitions, um, real strong ambitions, they want sustained studio visits, curatorial, they want production budgets, they want to travel, they want to go to the Biennales, they want access to magazines. They, they're not happy just to be given a studio and, you know, in a, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a very tough one. But um, those and those organisations, unfortunately, were um, supported by a kind of um, outfall of colonialism. The Goethe Institute, the British Council, the Institute Francais, Pro Helvetia, which were all parts of the departments of foreign affairs, not the British Council, but all the others that I refer to. Um, and they have agendas. I mean, we when I worked for the Puma Foundation before this project, um, we sponsored the Bamako Photography Biennale and the Dance Biennale, and the artists would come to me all the time and complain bitterly about the sponsors kind of constructing African practice according to the agenda that they had in mind, because they were not only funding it, but managing these programs. And I think the artists are 
I think a lot more comfortable being slaves to the market than being slaves to kind of the end of European colonialism. You know, I don't know which is the worst master. <laughs> oh dear. Over there at the back. It's working. Mm -hmm. uh, I find what you, you're doing is very interesting because you are building an ecosystem from nothing. And you're building an ecosystem, an art ecosystem, in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think that it's, and especially also in a very important country in Africa. What is, what is interesting for me, what I would like to know, when you built an ecosystem like this in a country like South Africa, who are the main leaders, the engine of the ecosystem? Is it the artist? Is it one collector who decides to become a, a, you know, a leader? Is it the government? Wh what makes an ecosystem in the beginning mm. works, mm. especially in a country like South Africa? You know, I can't answer universally your question. I can answer from my experience. Um, I was at, in Miami bef just before Art Basel. One of the reasons why um, I was asked to come out was because there was this idea that it potentially could happen. And um, now when you talk to people from Miami, everybody will take claim for, they were the ones that met Art Basel, they were the ones that brought it. You know, it's amazing how many people take credit when something's successful. Um, I remember when it happened, it was a couple of collectors and Sam and a couple of people from Basel. And it was, it was really, I mean, I remember the first Art Basel was canceled, the second Art Basel, um, some galleries didn't sell very well, especially the German galleries, because they brought very ambitious installations, conceptual, tough stuff, you know, made out of styrofoam and pieces of sticks, and people thought, oh, I'm not going to buy that. And I remember Rosa de la Cruz um, met with Sam, and I watched them. I actually said, Rosa, what are you doing? Um, and her and her um, children each made a commitment of a million dollars, and they walked around with Sam, and, sa and, sa and she said, okay, take us to the galleries that have not sold. Um, because they knew if that fair didn't work, it just wouldn't be there, and the impact for the city um, would be enormous. So they walked around, and Sam said, well, this gallery hasn't covered their booth. So they said, well, how much? And she bought a piece for that amount. And then they w moved on. So there was a real, I remember <sighs> so many of the co collectors extended themselves both in purchases but also in taking on spaces and doing exhibitions and hiring staff and making parties. And we just spent millions and millions of dollars to make sure that this worked. Um, now, of course, the community benefit from it greatly, uh, a place that to a large extent was, somebody used this word yesterday, a cultural desert, has now become a place that we all at least think about when we think about visual practice. Um, so in Africa, um, there's always been, it's always been a contested territory, unfortunately, contested by European powers, um, who, as we know, got together on a regular basis and sat down and divided the map up and said, okay, you get that. We, I mean, South Africa, I don't know if you know, we were uh, Dutch, then we were English, then we were Dutch, then we were even French for a little while. And then the English invaded and had a war with the French because they thought it's too important a land mass um, to let the French have it. So, I mean, the whole country, I mean, the reason that I am there, my family, I think, arrived in the 1700s, um, is the same story. We were just constantly being kind of, you know. Um, subsequent to that, um, there's been of late um, a kind of new kind of control, let's say, and that had to do with an academic there were certain curators who took intellectual ownership of the kind of conversation. Um, I don't want to name names, but I'm sure you all know who they are, who felt that they were the authorities on art in Africa. And it was a very complex, identity-driven, um, intellectualized, um, post-colonial, theoretical way of approaching this. 
which to a large extent excluded a lot of people in that discourse and reserved it kind of in an academic realm. Um, that's been usurped by the commercial uh, sector. Um, who's driving it right now? Um, I don't think anybody, to be honest. Um, I think that it's the same thing that happened in Miami. Connectors that would not talk to each other got together to plan to figure out how to make Art Basel successful. So uh, what we are doing with the institution and Mr. Zeitz is normally I would not make comments in um, certain commercial realms like in press releases for auction houses, but everybody wants this to work because everyone is so excited about it. So everybody's been very cooperative. So I think it's a very cooperative system where the collectors and the gallerists and the curators and everyone is working together. Um, I can't say it, but what everyone's saying to me is that they think that this might be the final driver, which is a very dangerous position for myself and Mr. Zeitz to be in, because it means that we're going to mess up and it's going to be very public, And um, but it is what it is. You know, I think I would rather try and do it and make mistakes than not do it at all. Um, so I think, as I said before, a lot was happening, but it was kind of under the radar. Now we position it in a very public way. So how it happens and wh who's the kind of drivers will be seen, will be critiqued. But we're still in the honeymoon phase where everybody is just so excited about what's happening. Um, and the journalists have been very responsible. I think um, they have not, you see the, the, the kind of academic writing around Africa has been, remember when Robert Storr, a couple of Venice Biennales ago, worked with a um, uh, uh, private collector from Angola. Th the the mudslinging and attacks between Okwe Enwazor and Robert Storr and a whole bevy of these kind of, it was just beyond extreme, you know. It was just one bloody pavilion, you know. Um, so it's such a... Um, but that hasn't started to happen yet, unless it's happening behind my back and nobody wants to tell me. Um, and important journalists understand, well, let's just first discuss it, let's first understand it before we tear it apart, um, as opposed to the more academic texts where I think there's a threat of territory, where it's like, well, <gasps> if you're moving in, what does that say about my position? So we have to attack you, you know? So. It's it's a honeymoon right now, and I think in a honeymoon everyone is happy, you know. Maybe it uh, somehow has to do with the honeymoon, but I had uh, the kind of chance or opportunity to be in Russia in S in Saint P uh, Petersburg at the time it was still Leningrad, when literally and living with these artists, when literally all the museum people came uh, parading. Uh, and left a lot of money there and bought mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. And I have seen artists who were film stars and artists and people who did basically something completely different become artists and they catered stuff. Literally, they knew, oh, tomorrow uh, the guy from the Guggenheim comes, tomorrow the guy from the Pompidou comes. Mm -hmm. And I, we, we occupied, I mean, they occupied with precisely with that money, the Moike opposite the castle. So one of these uh, gigantic, you know, aristocratic residences, mm -hmm. which is like part of the castle installation, was for us. And they just paid everybody off, and, and we could party there. And so each time somebody was come, it was a huge party. And, and, and they made the work the evening before. Mm. And some of them showed and, and, and were su quite successful, and today you don't hear anything anymore. Mm. You know, um, so how was that? I mean, I'm not saying this is happening with South Africa. You're not going to get it. I'll tell to you why. To what degree? And I'll tell you why. Because um, I mentioned this earlier. It's an incredibly rigorous system um, where shit just doesn't get through. It didn't get through before because there was no financial viability in trying those games. Because you got no prestige, you got no power, you got no parties, you, got no, you didn't get anything to be an artist. To be a gallerist, you got nothing. To be a curator. So for a very long time, there was a practice with that was very um, just rigorous, very authentic, very clear, very almost hardcore in a way. 
and the system now, through the, the academic system, the gallery system, all these layers, it's not like uh, Russia. You know, I um, lectured in um, St. Petersburg for many years um, at Smolny College. Um, and um, it's not like what you see in China or in Russia, where it's just a free-for-all and all hell breaks loose. Somehow, because they've been separate, they've developed a very rigorous system. I think the danger is the system is so rigorous that it might actually not allow. One of the things that um, I'm realizing is that, they, that the, the, the scene is way too self-referential. They look too much inside and not outwards. So I don't think there's a fear of that happening. I think it's exactly the opposite, um, that perhaps people who come uh, might be a little thrown by how hardcore the artists are. I mean, the artists don't take shit. I mean, they don't... They don't put up with this kissy kissy just to make the sale. I mean, because they didn't, it's not part of their psyche. It might happen as we go forward, as the market is becoming stronger. But right now, I'm just so impressed with how the artists, many of them who've wanted that have left. They've gone to seek careers where the golden pots are at the end of the rainbow. But the ones that stayed, I mean, William Kentridge, I think, is a good example. He could have made fortunes anywhere in the world, but he made a commitment to stay, you know. Um, so I don't see, but it's an issue, and it's going to happen, um, and I think we're going to see, as this develops, I'm sure we're going to see the whole Art Basel, Miami Beach phenomena, where the parties have basically become so out of control that um, the real artists, if they're such real, almost become lost in the fray. You know, I made a comment yesterday about these art weekends where um, Winwood became so successful that nobody who really loves art wants to even go to those things anymore because you're so lost in the craziness of the party town and these brands doing these pop-up exhibitions, which is not even art. You know, it's, it's, yeah, so it's a, it's a very tough... We haven't seen that yet. And, yeah. Sorry, and I what think about we must uh, let's move on for one portion. let's move on for one more question and we have time. Can I come back to you? Okay, there's a question there at the back, and then let's do Alan. Oh, there. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, I, I'm intrigued that um, you haven't really talked about Lagos. Mm -hmm. Is that because you see it as a sort of enemy center? <laughs> Uh, the Niger no. uh, BC Centre is my BC Silva is my hero. Yeah, but I think given the done. amount of energy uh. and a lot of a lot of what you've been talking about is the yeah. money here. Uh. There's certainly a lot of that there. Oof. A lot of energy. A Absolutely. Lot of, uh, but I'm intrigued that when you mentioned four different centres, you uh. didn't choose Lagos as one of them. You know, um, I think for us, we wanted to do something where we could have impact. And um, what's happening in Nigeria and in Lagos, it's extraordinary. Um, I think that the rela relationship with the Tate, what Elvira is doing, is extraordinary. So why do we need to replicate something that's already kind of happening? I think, you know, if you ask Mr. Zeitz about why he's interested, he said, Mark, I just want to do something that matters. He said to me, you know, he's German. He lives in Switzerland. He has homes all over the world. And he said to me, you know, if he did this in Germany or Switzerland, it would really wouldn't matter, you know. So... I have utmost respect for them, and I think that, to a large extent, they're going to be my teachers. Um, people like Bessie and Okwi and Simon Jami and many of these people. Um, and I'm going to have to be open to, to listen to their guidance. Um, no, there's no competition at all. If anything, um, I think it's what they've achieved. Um, kind of gave us the confidence to believe that we could also contribute something. Yeah. We need, we need to stop. We have to stop. Okay. Thanks, guys. <laughs>